So with that, um, I am honored to introduce our panel for today's discussion. Um, we're super pleased to have as a guest, Sandro Galea, who is a uh, Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. I think, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, Sandra, I think that you were going to join us like a year ago and we canceled because of, of COVID. So, so thrilled to have you here. Um, Sandra is really a, a leader in the field of health equity research. He's published extensively on um, social causes of health, mental health, and the consequences of trauma, and is uh, one of the most widely cited scholars in the area of, of social science research within um, the field of public health. Um, he's also chair of the board of ASPPH um, and past president of the Society for Epidemiologic Research and uh, the Interdisciplinary Association for Pop Population Health Science and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, we're also thrilled to have here today Dr. Anjum Hajat, who's uh, an epidemiologist in our own Department of Epidemiology. Um, who works on social and environmental determinants of health and looking at how those contribute to um, poor health and health disparities. Her research examines the intersection of psychosocial stressors and air pollution on creating and maintaining environmental health disparities in addition to environmental justice. Um, in addition to being in our Department of Epidemiology, she's also a faculty affiliate in the Center for Studies on Demography and Ecology and the West Coast Poverty Center, both at the University of Washington. We are also super excited to have with us Mayan Simkis, who graduated from our Department of Epidemiology with her PhD in 2019. Her dissertation work, which was chaired by Dr. Hajat, examined the intersection of population health and militarized policing in the United States. During her time at the University of Washington, um, Ayan also worked with Associate Dean uh, Janet Baseman to establish the UW Student Epidemic Action Leaders, or SEAL team, um, which continues to provide focused training in applied epidemiology and has been super active during the pandemic, deploying students to local and state health departments to work on pandemic response, and also managing um, contact tracing here at the University of Washington. Um, in collaboration with our environmental health and safety folks. Prior to coming to the University of Washington, Mayan served as an applied epidemiology fellow with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists in Portland, Oregon. She joined the Washington State Department of Health in 2019 after she graduated as a behavioral health epidemiologist in the Office of the State Health Officer. Since January of 2020, Mayan has been active in the agency's COVID-19 incident management team, where she established the COVID-19 Literature Situation Report, or Lit Rep, which hopefully you guys are all subs subscribers to, um, which is now run by a team at the UW Alliance for Pandemic Preparedness, which is based in our own Department of Global Health. And finally, last but not least, we have a fantastic current PhD student um, in the Department of Epidemiology, Ann Massey. And Ann um, also has taken part in the SEAL team, both as a member and a teaching assistant, um, and continues to be involved in um, helping to support current deployments, um, both at, on our campus and also in Washington DOH. Her current research um, focuses on injury and violence epidemiology, and we're super excited to have her here as a moderator. So with that, Anne, I'm gonna pass it over to you and I'm going to uh, turn off my camera. I'm still here watching you guys, but thrilled to just learn from you guys and hear what you have to say. So take it away, Anne. Thanks so much, Hillary. Um, well, it's an honor to be here with these three incredible panelists um, that we just heard about. And we're gonna start with a question um, for each of the panelists. Um, can all discuss this, this first one. And then from there, it'll be a little bit more of an organic structure. Um, so we'll start with Sandra. Uh, can you speak to what lens you bring to this discussion of COVID-19 and health equity? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for inviting me. Thank you, Dean Godwin, for having me here. And uh, thank you to the team at uh, UW who really has done a terrific job in uh, bringing us all together. And thank you to um, Anne for uh, facilitating this panel. Um, I um, I find myself 
when I talk about uh, health equity in the context of COVID-19, feeling like I first have to take a step back and to say that most of what I have to say about health equity in COVID-19, I could have said in 2019 before we had ever heard of COVID-19. But in many respects, most of, uh, when I look back at my writing and speaking, I've actually been writing and speaking the same thing and COVID-19 didn't really create an inflection point. It was simply continuing what I was writing and speaking. So the challenges that we faced around health equity pre-existed long before COVID-19. And they, of course, pertain to the full set of forces at the eco-social and within an eco-social frame, going all the way from our politics, our policies, our states, our cities, where we live, and extending throughout our entire life that fundamentally affect our health. And all of those forces are arrayed in a way that create inequities in health, create what I've written about as health haves and have, have nots, that maps on to haves and have nots in terms of material and other types of assets. That mapping is typically in the United States, and we can talk in a global context if you wish, maps onto two axes. One of them is race, race slash ethnicity, and the other one is socioeconomics. Broadly speaking, there are those assets map onto race, which in the US has complicated, complicated expressions. It uh, pertains to American Indian natives, uh, pertains to Latin Latinx people, but in particular pertains to Black Americans. And a lot of that traces back to slavery and conditions of disenfranchisement for Black Americans that goes back centuries. So it maps onto race and it maps onto socioeconomic position. And socioeconomic position fundamentally is mapped onto by assets like income and wealth and education. Now, there's overlap, substantial overlap between race and socioeconomic position. It's not, it's imperfect overlap. It's, it, it, is, it is certainly not 100% overlap. There are, there are people who are disadvantaged in socioeconomic axis who do not have particular visible identity markers that disadvantage them and vice versa. So that's the setup. That's the sort of pre-COVID setup. Now we enter COVID. And COVID really was an expression of what was underlying. COVID revealed what already was there. COVID made, made abundantly clear that there are these racial inequities and, um, and socioeconomic inequities. And if I just, let me just talk about one axis just for the ease of time, because I don't want to keep our opening comments short. So let's talk about the racial differences in COVID. And uh, let's specifically focus on black-white differences. They're actually aware a number of racial ethnic differences in COVID. There's Latinx differences. There's also American, American Indian native um, differences with white, but let's just focus on black white differences. Broadly speaking, black Americans died of COVID at twice the rate of white Americans, broadly speaking. And the question is, the question is why is that? And I think in the public conversation, right, there's a lot of noise about this appropriately, but there hasn't been the clarity of discussion about why that is. And when you ask yourself the question, why do the Black Americans have twice the rate of COVID death than white Americans, you have to say, well, what's involved in COVID death? Well, to have a COVID death, you first need to get COVID. And then if you get COVID, you need to have severe COVID. And the risks factors for both those stages are actually quite different. So why did Black Americans have a greater rate of getting COVID, which by the way, they did, um, uh, compared to white Americans? Well, the reason is that you get COVID as a direct result of exposure. And when, particularly in the first wave, when we didn't know much about COVID, there was this enormous turn in how we operate as a society where people started working from home and all that. Well, working from home is directly patterned on socioeconomic position and also on race. Actually, separate and apart from socioeconomic position, Black Americans are more likely to be essential workers than are white Americans. When we do, we've, we have a couple of studies on this, other groups have other studies on this. When we look at, for example, at data about mobility, you see very clearly that white Americans were able to distance several days before black Americans. And in the context of a pandemic, when we didn't know anything, that actually made all the difference. So that's the risk of getting the disease. Now, you can ask the question, okay, so there's fine, there's a greater risk of black Americans and white Americans getting the disease, but when they get the disease, is the risk of severe disease equal? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not. Black Americans have actually higher risk of severity of the disease once they get disease compared to white Americans. And the question is, why is that? Well, that has nothing to do with the, with the risk factors I just talked about. It's nothing to do with contracting disease. Now you already have the disease. What it has to do with is the underlying conditions that make you vulnerable to having severe COVID. And those underlying, underlying conditions are fundamentally underlying comorbidities. We've known from the earliest data from China CDC that people who are likely to have severe COVID are people who have underlying conditions, cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and a whole range of conditions that actually we know 
are disproportionate risk burdens that, that are in Black American community versus the white American community. And these risk factors were there before. Simply COVID all of a sudden made them much more of a present concern because with COVID, they became a risk factor for death. So all of this is to say that the patterning of what happened with COVID around health inequities really reflects the underlying pattern of assets, be they material assets, be they employment assets, that characterize racial and socioeconomic differences, coupled with the underlying pattern of a morbidity, which is of course directly linked to assets, that then affected severity of death from COVID. So what I hope will emerge from this time, if one if one can be afforded the, um, the privilege of having hope in a dark moment like this, it is that this will elevate our awareness of these circumstances, which as I said, were there before, so that we actually once and for all tend to them and once and for all are able to make the case that being having haves and have nots in society is inextricable from having health haves and have nots. That is inextricable link to socioeconomic inequities and racial ethnic inequities. And it is fundamentally a moral obligation and a practical obligation for us to fix that. And let me just end on the last point, because I think in public health, we it's easy for us, it's easy for us as a crowd to say, look, there's a moral obligation. Like we talk this language. It's it's quite it's, it's quite unusual language outside the public health community. And what I'm hoping that um, the COVID moment illustrates is because our health is so interdependent, it makes it clear that separate apart from moral obligation, there's actually a very practical, practical reason why we want everybody's health to actually be better, why we actually want to narrow these health gaps. And I'm hoping that we in public health can now use this moment as a teachable moment and as a very pragmatic, practical moment for improvement. And as Dean Godman mentioned at the beginning, I think um, this is a moment for optimism and hope. And I actually think that uh, um, the, the team of uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, have um, assembled our people who in the main understand these points. Now, of course, having individuals who understand these points is necessary, but not sufficient for change to actually happen. So it remains to be seen what will happen. I'll stop there. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, Anjum, I'll go to you. Great, thank you. Yes, to echo uh, Sandra's point, I just want to say thank you all for having us. This is great. I hope uh, this is a fruitful panel for uh, all the attendees. So. Um, and also just to echo some of uh, the other points previously made to sort of indicate where my work can sort of help um, the understanding of, of what is currently ongoing. So, you know, prior to the pandemic, I had a project working on uh, precarious work. So that is this uh, sort of unstable and insecure work uh, that, and our thought was that this type of work is exacerbating health inequity and resulting in poor health outcomes. So naturally when COVID happened, it was such a, an obvious, um, shift to sort of start thinking about uh, very specifically some of these essential workers who often are also precariously employed, that is uh, low wage workers with limited benefits, um, you know, and in this time, uh, having no uh, sick leave is, is truly problematic and rather atrocious, right, for a society like ours. Uh, so uh, my lens really is thinking about um, the, the sort of employment side of things, uh, but that really is, as Dr. Galea said, very much overlapped with race uh, as well. So we know that work in America is very racialized and very segregated and has been for you know the past uh, probably 60, 70 years. So um, well, before that, from the beginning of our nation actually. So you know th these things are hard to disentangle. I think disentangling the race from the social class to me it's 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 really uh, a, a problem that we need to think about holistically. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is uh, I also like to think about in my work uh, where we can see accumulation of different stressors. So these same communities that tend to be hardest hit by COVID also are facing sort of a, a, a slew of different stressors in their daily lives pre-COVID and now post-COVID. So uh, trying to understand sort of what accumulation of, of stress does both at the social level, but also in the physical environment, uh, things like air pollution and green space, uh, there's been, you know, is a considerable research thinking about how, how additional stressors tend to worsen outcomes uh, for COVID and for other things. So uh, yeah, that I guess is where, uh, where, where I'm coming from. Maya? Thanks, Anne, and thank you for moderating. Thanks everyone to the UW for inviting me back to my alma mater so soon, how kind of you. Uh, I wanted to note that I'm not in the Seattle area. I'm joining uh, this meeting from the traditional home of the Puyallup Indians, who have been the stewards of these lands and waters since time immemorial. 
So what lens am I bringing? You know, I'm a recent graduate. What do I have to share? I think my uh, window here, my lens has to do with that intersection of uh, various fields, cross-sector research and cross-sector practice. So my passion and my career leads me into this world of public health practice, working at public health agencies in the field, doing work that is responsive to the immediate needs of our communities, of our disparate communities, those who are least served and those who are most served in different ways. And so my hope is to provide a, a Washington specific lens on some of the questions that we'll talk about today, uh, maybe share some of the programming that we've been doing and some of the data, but also to help folks, particularly students and maybe those who are early career, thinking about how you can center equity in the work that you do through COVID and through other public health challenges. How do we truly take this field of public health and push the needle towards moving equity and social justice into the central um, priorities of what we do. Uh, I will also say that it can be a challenging path at times to bring equity into a conversation in a field where we have many seasoned professionals and colleagues who still need to be brought into the conversation. And so it's my hope to help provide some empowering tools and, and some words to help guide some of my um, former peers who might still be in our programs and those who are already out in the field trying to do this important work. Thank you, Maureen. So um, Sandra, we'll go back to you. And you touched on this a bit in your opening remarks, but can you um, describe or maybe continue to add to uh, how factors like race, ethnicity, age, gender, socioeconomic status uh, contribute to health outcomes in the United States beyond just COVID-19? Yeah, so it really is, um, it's an excellent question because I think it pushes us to make sure that we elevate the visibility of issues like race and socioeconomic position beyond the COVID-19 moment. So we should put this in perspective. So the, the, the toll of COVID-19 has been terrible. It's about, let's say, 400,000 deaths in 20, 2020, understanding that that's likely to go and go up. That, that's, that's really terrible toll. But the country has about um, 3 million deaths a year. So I think it's important to actually sort of have that perspective. Now, why am I saying that? I'm not saying that to minimize COVID-19, not at all. I'm saying that to say that those 3 million deaths are all colored by socioeconomic health inequities and by racial health inequities, like all of them. Like there are really very few conditions. There are some, but there are very few conditions where you don't have socioeconomic radiance and racial um, health disparities. So the number of deaths the, the, in a recent paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Wrigley Field concluded that it roughly, if there's about a 500,000 death difference that ex across the board in terms of racial inequities in health in the country, which is of course the total number of deaths from COVID unless obviously COVID accelerates. So I think it's actually very important to recognize that what we are seeing in COVID and what has prompted a lot of national soul searching. And I think in a large extent was the direct impetus for the largest civil protest ever in the country's history. The, the, the Black Lives Matter riots, uh, sorry, Black Lives Matter's protests, the riots were a totally separate issue, um, um, where the largest civil protests ever in the country's history with about 10 million people um, um, uh, walking in uh, civil protests in the country. The, um, those reflect a, fundamentally a deep dissatisfaction, a deep dissatisfaction with uh, a state of affairs that should have been dissatisfying a long time ago. And I think it actually is a really important moment. So going back to how do we think of this non-COVID-19 moment? Well, this is always an issue. This, is, this, this has been an issue for decades and for centuries and will continue to be an issue. And I think our job is to say, what should be done? What should be done to remove these inequities. And the only way that we're going to address these inequities is by actually being systematic about it. Like we need to say, is it acceptable that there is a 15 year life, life expectancy gap between the wealthiest versus the least wealthy Americans? We need to say, is it acceptable that black Americans on average, as nothing to do with COVID, have a four to five year um, uh, gap in life expectancy compared to white Americans? And then we need to say, well, what is it that causes that? 
and how can we tackle it? And I actually think you know, the same way that, I, in, that at the beginning, I systematically teased apart why is it that there's a higher um, rate of black American death from COVID and white American, right? I said, look, there are two different phases. There's risk factors for A, risk factors for B. There are also similar risk factors for A, risk factors for B, for um, 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 black Americans versus white Americans, Latinx Americans, Native Americans, et cetera. I just want to add one last uh, thing in uh, the um, the I, I did a paper with a good colleague, um, uh, Premier Bassett, a few months ago, where in that paper we argued that the persistent black-white gap in health achievement, and we used some specific examples, is a compelling argument why anything short of black reparations would not really, put, is not going to put a dent in that gap. And the argument there is actually very simple, is that we are not closing, we are we're not going to, for decades and centuries, going to close the asset gap enough in order to close the health gap enough. It's actually that simple. And that black Americans have been deprived of the opportunity to actually accumulate assets over generations. Um, and the wealth gap is very abundantly clear. And the wealth gap between black and white Americans is extraordinary and actually widening. That the only way to fix that is through a, an inflection, a true inflection. And inflection in this case would be actually saying, stop, we should fix this. And inflection would be, let's recalibrate our assets. Let's change the, have, the haves have nots equation, which then is going to change the health haves have nots equation. And I realized that that, at least based on the correspondence I received out of the piece, substantially controversial, I realized that. But I'm actually trying to be logical about it. I mean, I'm really trying to make a dispassionate argument, not a political argument, that being logical, once you understand health inequities, I'm not sure how you could conclude anything different than that. Terrific point. Thank you so much. Um, Andra Mermayan, anything else to add to this question? Yeah, I will just um, echo some of that and say, you know, the wealth gap that we've had in our nation uh, I feel like gets a lot less uh, attention than the income inequality gap. We've been talking about income inequality, and if you remember back to the uh, the Wall Street protests years ago, you know, really a lot of that was about income. And I think income is uh, is more comfortable for people to talk about because it, you can link it really to, oh, well, it's about your job, it's about this, it's about you. Whereas wealth is really structural and historic, and I think it's really critical to remember that that's where the biggest gaps are. Uh, and there's a reason that people uh, feel a little hesitant to, to talk about that, but yeah. Great, thank May you both. I, yeah, May please. I add one thing, sir, to, to, um, to Andrew, because I, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Like, like, like we, we talk about this, but uh, just to give you a sense of scale, like I actually think it's important to put scale in it. I'll just talk about Boston, which is uh, where I live. Um, a recent study showed that uh, average average white American family in Boston has about $250,000 in wealth. The average black American family in, in Boston has zero wealth. Like, just, just to give a sense of the scope. So broadly speaking, when you look at national data in terms of incomes, in terms of black families versus white families, income in white families is about 1.5 times higher than black families. Wealth is 10 times higher. And, and the wealth gap persists across all levels. So the, the wealth gap is actually wider at higher incomes than it is at lower incomes, which is actually quite remarkable. It's actually why they're at higher education than it is at low education. And I, you know, I can show you all these data. So, so I do think that um, we uh, to fix something like that requires both understanding it and true depth of policy, intentional policy making, intentional policy making, because otherwise we're not going to fix it. So I apologize, I just want to add to that. Please add whenever you would like. That's, I think, as, as organic as this can be is terrific. So I think anytime, um, please jump in. And these are terrific points um, being made. Uh, Mayan, did you have anything to add to this, this one? Let's move on. I know we have a lot of questions up ahead. Okay. Great. OK, so um, Anjum, let's, let's go back to you. And uh, as, as we learned that your, um, much of your research focuses on social determinants, uh, can you speak to which social determinants can help to reduce uh, health inequities, maybe jumping back to this conversation about wealth or, and or adding, adding on to it? Yeah, so just to step back, you know, uh, I hate to be super jargony 
be. So let's just define what is a social determinant, right? So when we talk in public health about social determinants, uh, we're talking about systems and structures that impact our lives uh, and our health uh, across the, the lifespan. So at every stage, at every, uh, at every place, really. So when I think about the sort of the systems and structures, to me, what's really critical in terms of helping to alleviate health inequity is, is really related to policy. So social and economic policy, but also to our existing systems, our political systems and our economic systems. Um, so I think those things are really critical. And I, you know, it should be noted that as public health professionals, people have been grappling with issues around reducing health inequity for many decades, uh, but we're not there yet. So clearly this is a difficult problem, right? Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we require difficult problems really require multi-pronged uh, and comprehensive approaches. So, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is really the importance of thinking about policy. So, you know, Sandra mentioned reparations, but there are really many other policies, right? Our economic policies, social policies, labor policies, uh, health policies, you know, and we've made some progress in recent years around some of those things, but there really is a lot more to be done. You know, for example, uh, you know, in this time, the fact that people don't have paid sick leave is really problematic, right? Uh, that should not be the case for any worker in the nation. So um, I, I would start there and, you know, whatever, wh whichever policies can most help to reduce some of these wealth inequities is what we should be targeting. And some of those are just not going to be popular with, uh, you know, with middle class America, but these are things that are, that are the reality, right? Um, and then the second thing I'll say is there are also things that can be done at the local level and that communities can really um, think about to try to help alleviate some of the health inequities that we see. So, you know, housing tends to be a very local issue. As we know here in Seattle, we have a tremendous housing problem with unaffordable housing just being rampant. Um, other, other related things, high quality education, it can also be very tackled somewhat locally. Uh, of course, there's lots of federal policies that could help as well. Uh, things like job training opportunities tend to be local too, given that the local economies differ across, across the nation. So I think, you know, community development programs that can help to, uh, to create sort of safer neighborhoods and more opportunities for people. Uh, and I think the bottom line here is trying to create an environment for people to lead healthier lives, right? Uh, and really taking that onus off the individual about, well, it's your responsibility, it's your health, because uh, that's, not, that's not the case at all, really. We need to be thinking much more bigger scale uh, and around more structural inequities. So I really appreciate uh, the angle that Anjum took here talking about some of the strengths that we really see at the local level. And I think this is one of our largest challenges uh, as practitioners of public health and as researchers, as um, local public health practice, state public health practice, is that we're so focused on identifying the problems and describing the challenges that face different communities. Let's go back to a word that Sandra used and that's assets. We forget to think about the strengths and the assets that different communities bring to different challenges. So if we think about with regard to COVID and I know we'll get to it, um, we have had outbreaks around our state and around our country in small communities and small local communities tend to know better what's best for their communities. And this is something we'll harp back on, I'm sure, throughout this talk, that there is expertise and wisdom in these particular communities, especially those that are most underserved and marginalized by our public health, our healthcare, and our broader societal systems. So if we think about, for example, one of our um, tribes in the state of Washington that had a couple outbreaks early on, their response was far more effective than, say, our national response on a national scale, not just because the numbers were smaller, because proportionally it was still quite impactful, but because we had local people driving the practices, driving the response and using that inherent knowledge and wisdom and strength to drive what they're doing in their response efforts. And the same thing goes when we look at chronic diseases as well, where we see that things like social cohesion could have a tremendous impact on our stress and on how we embody the experiences that we have. And there's other factors related to nutrition or to movement that can have a real impact on health. And those truly are some of the social determinants that are strengths that we can uh, tie into. And we often forget in those conversations. Perfect point, thank you. Thank you both for that one. Um, so now if we do focus back on COVID-19, so as we've discussed, this pandemic has amplified and underscored the presence of health inequities in the United States. Um, 
well, let's go back to Sandro. Um, and this is kind of a two part question. So can you speak to one, what factors are driving inequity? And we've talked a bit about this already, but if you have anything to add to that piece. And then two, um, what does inequity look like in the data? Yeah. And you mean COVID-19 specifically? Correct. Yeah, so, so COVID-19 has been a moment of extraordinary triumph. And I, I realize as I say that everybody in the audience is like, what's he saying? Um, I think it's been an extraordinary triumph of biomedicine, right? We have developed a vaccine in unbelievable record time. Like, 10 months for vaccine to be approved is, you know, the previous fastest vaccine was four years, which was mumps, and typically vaccines take 10 year plus. That's remarkable. And the mRNA technology previously not been used. I mean, this is really a moment of great triumph. So it's a moment of great biomedical triumph. The problem is it's a moment of utter failure of the conditions in which we live that ultimately shape inequities and that also shape inequities around COVID-19. So we succeeded in medicine and we failed in everything else. And it's the everything else that of course resulted in COVID-19 being the catastrophe that I think unquestionably it is. And that everything else is also what shapes health in general and shapes health inequities in general. And uh, Andrew you know, correctly said, well, let's be specific. What do we mean by social determinants? And uh, I would even take that a step further, which I suspect Andrew would agree with me that we probably should not use the word social determinants at all outside of this room. And, and the reason for that is just people don't know what we mean by that. It's, it's like, it's, it's sort of a, it's a technical term and it's not really helping us. Um, um, you know, the, the last book that I did, which really was a social determinants book, my challenge for myself was to never use the term social determinants in a social determinants book, which is really what I tried to do. Um, um, so the, the inequities in the context of COVID-19 were a direct result of the challenges in place where we live, where we work, where we play the challenges in having livable wages, the challenges in having opportunities and flexibility to protect oneself, the challenges to, to, uh, that uh, we have not had control over violence, the challenges that we actually have not created a world where there is no racism, no sexism, no misogyny, all these forces. And those are all the forces that shape health in general and that create health divides. And that's ultimately what affected um, health during COVID-19. So the problem with that, with what I'm saying is, I mean, we can agree or disagree, but let's say we agree for a second, is that it's a lot, like it's a lot for people to take. Like it's sort of like, you know, I can say it in this room and, you know, we may agree or disagree, we we'll probably broadly agree with like those of us in this room, but it's a lot to take outside this room. So, so, so the question is, the, the question is, how does one, how does one translate this message? And I think the way to translate the message is, by making it clear that we cannot have better health without creating a better world. And we cannot have, we cannot narrow health gaps without narrowing resource gaps and asset gaps. And somehow we need to find the language and the scholarship to back it up to make that case. So I'm not sure I'm fully answering your question, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical, very broad question. And I'm perhaps only taking a corner, but I'd be very curious what Mayan and Andrew have to say about it. That's terrific. I think we could do the entire, we could spend an hour and a half on this question alone, I think. So, so that's terrific. And then, um, yeah, Andrum, do you want to add to it? Yeah, I mean, I think just to reiterate, you know, whatever we can do to tackle the structural racism and the structural inequity that drive health, health inequity is what we need to be doing. So, um, you know, and that, that's, that's, again, a multi-pronged approach. So, um, but I agree with you, we could really spend forever talking about this and, uh, so, you know, maybe for another time. <laughs> so part of the question, Anne, I think was, you know, what does it look like in the data to say we have health inequities related to COVID? And both Sandro and Anjem have talked about um, the, the disparate amount of, of disease that we're seeing within certain populations, particularly, particularly our communities of color. Uh, and I think that is part of it. So let's just think about Washington for a moment. Everybody put on your epidemiology hats. I know you want to. So in Washington, we have our non-Hispanic white population. It accounts for 68% of the people who live in Washington. But in our white population, this only accounts for 47% of our confirmed cases of COVID. 
So now let's think about our Hispanic and Latinx populations. Uh, this population accounts for 13% of the people who live in Washington, but 34% of confirmed COVID cases. So what does this show us? It shows us that our, our Hispanic and Latinx community is accounting for a disproportionate amount of COVID in our state compared to our non-Hispanic white population. This is such a crystal clear example of the structural factors that are driving this outbreak and this, this uh, pattern of disease in our society. The virus doesn't discriminate. It doesn't see race. Race is a social construct made up by old white men. That is not something this virus understands. It understands understands crowded housing and congregate housing. It understands people who are sick and go to work anyway, and they don't have childcare so they can't stay home, or people who uh, need to put food on the table so they may go to work even if they are worried about a colleague or a peer who is sick. So there are so many structural factors that drive those numbers. And you know, every time we see these structural inequities and we think about the numbers, the differences in birth outcomes and cancer outcomes, we have to remember that it's, it's people, right? So there's data and there's what we can understand in the data. And then there's the individual stories. And it's not, it's not just numbers. So think about uh, Dr. Susan Moore from Indiana, who's a black physician who was diagnosed with COVID and was hospitalized, was then sent home and sent back and later died. But before she passed away, Dr. Moore shared that she was experiencing racist treatment in the hospital, that her providers, her healthcare providers were not treating her equitably, were treating her, as she said, like, um, like she was a drug addict and was not being honest about her pain. And ultimately when she passed away, it was pretty profound that she had made some very public statements about her experiences, but you know, this is obviously just the tip of the iceberg. And I hate to harp on that uh, very overused imagery, but it's true. For every one case of widely publicized racism in the healthcare system or racism in public health, there are so many more that haven't been reported and have gone unnoticed. So health equity in data can look like a lot of different things, but it's so important for us to also tease apart the data and understand who truly is being affected because these are these are people and these are communities. May I add one one thing to something Maya said, um, which I, I really I'm really glad you said it. Um, you said COVID is not differentiating based on race, which which I actually think is a critical point. Um, Professor uh, Patricia Washington, who's at the Northeastern, has an excellent essay on this on the challenge of what she calls, which I think is, is an apt term, sort of racial essentialism, that, that, that there's a danger in us saying COVID disparity, black, white, just use, use the term simply, because it gives the impression that there's something about the minuscule genetic difference that determines our skin pigment, which everybody in this, in this crowd understands it's, it's, it's of negligible import in terms of biological determination of health and substitutes that for the forces that actually determine differences. So I, I really appreciated um, Mayan's point about, in, in some respects, we should move our conversation. It's not that there's a black white gap, it's that there's a gap between people who actually are not able to distance safely, who do not have occupations that allow them um, flexibility, who are living in uh, congregate housing, who are unprotected. Those are the dimensions that actually matter for COVID. The fact that those tend to track with visible racial identity is almost an artifact of how we count, uh, but really the fundamental conditions are what's driving these differences. So then to tie it back into, uh, into counting and the data, the, um, I, I presume everybody in the audience is familiar with the COVID racial data tracker, which actually is run at our university, at Boston University through the, uh, now through the Center for Anti-Racist Research. Um, um, and, and if you look at those data, you'll actually find that uh, the, our data on these differences is quite imperfect. State by state, we're dealing with many states actually have a minority of, um, of cases that are marked enough for, in order for us to be able to understand them. And certainly no state has sufficient data on these other conditions. So we have a lot to go to shift the conversation from saying, it's not simply crude markers of identity that are like race. It's not even perhaps less crude, but even harder to get at socioeconomic status. It's actually all these other forces and variables that we know cause these disparities. And the importance of that shift in conversation is, of course, we can do something about these other forces. And, and, and those are, that, that, that is where things are actionable. That is where things are actionable. And um, 
I think there's a lot of education that we need to do. I actually, I haven't seen any surveys done about this. Maybe some of you have, and you know this, I don't. My bet is that if one were to do a survey right now and ask Americans sort of, you know, are you aware of black, white differences in COVID and people who say yes, and you ask them why, my bet is that a majority of people would then get boggled into it being something about genetics or something like that. That, that that's my bet, and, and we, we, which suggests how far we have to we have to go in these forces. I think just another um, comment on Mayan's point. I think the impact of real life stories and what can what those can do to help us move the needle and sort of. Uh, explain to policymakers and others that this is really critical for health and health inequity is is really important. So stories are really powerful, right? And I don't think in public health we use them enough to really get our, our points across. We use a lot of data, which you know people like numbers, but I think stories have a power that are just well beyond, uh, you know, a, a table, a two by two table, really, right? So I, I I really think that that partnership with others that are telling those stories. Uh, is really critical. Thank you, Andrew. So I think maybe we'll do one more question for the panelists, um, and then we'll we'll switch to some Q and A uh, in a moment. So um, if we look back on 2020 and recognizing that through this conversation we've identified that some of what we think about when we think about oh 2020 uh, is not specific to that year at all. These are long-standing, widespread structural issues. Um, but also there were certainly events that were unique to that moment in time in 2020 um, that, that created this very, um, I think, a circumstance we've never seen before. Um, I think we'll start with Mayan on this one. Can you speak to kind of thinking about both of those pieces and how they interacted in the year 2020 what challenges that created for public health in terms of promoting health equity uh, in communities? It's a great question. I mean, public health agencies, we were caught on our back feet here. Uh, we've been underfunded at public health agencies for decades across administrations. Uh, come Ebola back in 2014-15, we were underfunded to do our work in response to the United States. And for those who worked on that response effort and are also working on COVID now, COVID makes that seem like a breeze. And we were still massively underfunded. We didn't have the uh, national level guidance that we were anticipating for this sort of response. And regardless of how much preparation we may have had under our belts, it wasn't enough. So to me, the, the key challenge in making equity a central part of the work we do right now in this COVID moment, as folks are saying, is that we're dealing with an urgency and a speed that makes it very challenging to slow down, recognize the differences between the communities that we serve, and truly ensure that the work we're doing at our public health agencies is reaching those communities effectively. And it's something we should be doing all the time. It's something that I'm happy to say our Washington state organizations are working hard to do better on, but there's still so much more room for us to grow. And you know, there's some other factors we pulled into this year with us. First of all, public health has and medicine have lost the trust of the public in many ways. And with tremendously important and valid reasons. We can think about um, Henrietta Lacks, for example, as uh, an individual who had their uh, genetic materials taken and used incorrectly, the, uh, the Hafez Supai people as well in Arizona, and the Tuskegee syphilis trials, just three very simple examples of public health and medicine losing the trust of the public. And if these communities who perhaps have lost trust in us are the communities we most need to be supporting how are we going to do that effectively if we can't communicate? So I always say that public health's biggest challenge is that we have a huge PR issue. We are not great at communicating and no matter how much we try, there's always going to be room for improvement in communications. But on top of it, all communities, regardless of their background or their identities are exhausted right now. COVID fatigue is real. I'll turn to my colleagues to back me up on that but we're tired, public health messaging needs to be, um, people are tired of public health messaging. They don't wanna hear anymore. And we need to adapt the way that we communicate, not only so we reach these communities more effectively, but that we do so with a respect for the experiences everybody's been going through. So, you know, 
public health has never been in the spotlight more than we have been in the past 12 months. There's surges here and there, but we have been squarely in the spotlight. People see my you know, friendly neighborhood epidemiologist t-shirt when I'm at Trader Joe's and they know what I am. They actually understand my career and they don't ask me to look at nasty furry moles on their arms. So while that can be nice, minus the moles, uh, it, it does put us in a situation where we need to be setting an example as public health practitioners for the rest of our, our government agency partners, for the rest of our local politicians, our community leaders, everyone needs to be looking at public health right now for what we're doing well and what we're not doing well so we can learn and do better. So thinking about Washington a little bit more, you know, how are we actually promoting health equity and how is it challenging? So communication, absolutely. We need to reach uh, communities that speak different languages. Uh, some communities don't use internet regularly. If I think of our older population, iPhones, not really happening. The tone and the medium of communication matters. Um, we also have you know, resource allocation, support for folks who are in quarantine or in isolation. How do we get it to communities who maybe are not as welcoming of outsiders? How do we work with local healthcare workers and, and community health workers to maximize the way that we as public health are able to engage with communities that maybe are a little resistant and with good reason to, to communicate and engage with us? We also have interventions and programs. You can think about testing and vaccines. And each of these, you know, we really want to reach certain segments of our population who we know are a little asset deprived in, in um, are entering into the situation really at a deficit already. So how do we make it so that testing is not only accessible to these populations, but acceptable? And same for vaccines. So we're dealing with this sort of crisis of communication right now in COVID. We're dealing with speed and rigor and uh, it is urgent. So there's just a confluence of factors. We came in not prepared and we are doing what we can to succeed. And there have been, uh, as Sandra said, some real successes in public health too, not just in medicine and technology. Uh, and there have been some real shortfalls where we need to continue working. Thank you, Mayan. Um, Andram and uh, Sandro, do you have anything else to add? I will just sort of reiterate uh, the point about, you know, really working closely with communities. I think that is essential. So to sort of deal with the trust, the trust issues that are, that are have been long present, uh, you know, community based uh, both research and community based programmatic work is just critical. So I, I would just sort of put another plug in for that. And I know many of us are doing that, but I think we can always be doing more. Great, thank you. Um, and for those, it, it looks like some folks are putting questions in the chat box. So if you can put questions in the Q&A box, uh, that would be terrific. And also um, the hand raising, we're not monitoring just because there's so many folks. So if you have a, a question that you'd like to add, uh, please put it in the Q&A box or a chat if you'd like to communicate something else to the group. Uh, Sandra, do you have a comment? Yes, yeah, I was there. I realized I was speaking to my mute. Um, um, the, I, I was going to, um, to echo or underscore something Mayan said, um, which is that public health has a problem right now in terms of our communication. I actually think that uh, we in public health have, uh, have been, doing, we've been doing a lot of patting ourselves on the back lately. You know, public health has been in the front and center and all that. There's the Trader Joe's phenomenon. Um, um, the, um, but I actually do think, I think Mayan is correct. I, I think there is a general disaffection with the role public health has played in its messaging. Now we can say, well, it's because of the political circumstances. I mean, there are many reasons for it. Um, um, and, but I, I, I do think that there, is a, there should be a moment of careful reckoning in public health to say, what have we done wrong? and what could we do better and what can we learn from the moment? I, I am, um, my read, my read of my sense of the public health community is that, you know, we're, we're giving ourselves, uh, you know, an A, A minus. And I actually think that we're, we did a C, C, a C, a C plus at best. And uh, I can put in the chat sort of a recent paper I wrote trying to explain some of the things that I think we did wrong. And we, I mean, all of us. Um, but I do think it's gonna be in a moment of important reflection for us in public health 2021, it should be. Perfect, thank you all. Go ahead, Mayan. 
I just, I saw a comment in the chat and the questions that I thought would be a, a good one to hop in here as sort of a transition. So uh, the question is, can panelists touch on the importance of data disaggregation in regards to understanding health disparities related to COVID-19? Um, so very briefly, and then I'll turn to my colleagues here. Disaggregation just means that we have the COVID number, 440,000 or 400,000 deaths of COVID, and then breaking that down to understand which communities are being represented here. You know, this is one racial and ethnic category. This is one age group. This is by gender identity. Um, that dis that's what disaggregation is. And it's critical that we disaggregate data to understand who is truly being affected and to what degree and what are the factors that are driving those sorts of uh, cases. So a great example from Washington is that early on in the pandemic, we recognized a surge in cases within our agricultural workers, our farm working community. And there were a lot of reasons for this. Congregate housing, people weren't allowed to stay home when they were sick or needed to go in for, for uh, pay. Uh, uh, working conditions that were very crowded as well, a lack of personal protective equipment, and those sorts of factors you're going to miss if you're just looking at one really big number. So disaggregation is pretty critical when we're looking at the data. Sandra or Anjum, do you have any additional comments? My, 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 my only brief comment, I mean, I'm in complete agreement. I, I, I think um, our um, our data, particularly as it pertains to, um, to axes of difference that are linked to personal identity, I'm using the term generally on purpose, are um, they're really crude and, uh, and, um, and, and increasingly unhelpful. I mean, I think they were helpful in some respects at some point in time, but, you know, for example, um, um, you know, sort of Latino, Latino, Latin X, just, just, just a whole category of uh, sort of Latin ethnicity, just to use that term, is I think most people who are to think about this carefully, realize it's sort of it's an absurd category. Like it, 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 it is a category that embeds con literally continents. Now, you, know, you, you get at, at our measurement of African Americans specifically, which of course embeds whole ranges of people with diverse life experiences. I, I think it's a bit of a theme that is threading through this conversation. It's a bit of a thread through, through, through this data. Th these markers, these are markers that are really very superficial markers. Of lived experience, and and uh, as we're having this conversation, and I'm learning from it and thinking about it, it really is a call for us to push the lived experience elements, the elements that thread throughout our life course, and the elements that reflect how we live, who we interact with, where we live, the policies that affect that. Those are the elements that matter to shape health. And frankly, our markers of identity, to use that term again, are relatively. They're, they're, it's not relatively. They actually are broadly unimportant. They really broadly do not matter for our health. I mean, they matter a tiny bit. We shouldn't oversimplify. They matter a tiny bit. There are particular particular diseases that are in a little bit linked, let's say, to race, some links to gender. But broadly speaking, our large markers of identity, race and gender, just to use those two, they are far, far, far less significant than everything else. Great. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I think we'll turn to to the um, Q and A a bit further. And um, as my aunt did, uh, Anjum and Sandro, if you ha if you see anything in there that that calls out to you and you want to take, that would that's fine. Um, I will start to um, I'll tee one up, uh, which I hope I'm going to combine a couple. I'm going to try to combine a couple, and hopefully that is to the benefit of covering more ground and not uh, to the detriment of not actually getting any of them as directly as we could. So there is there's interest and curiosity about um action what do we do um so how do we go about dismantling the root causes and you know some of the examples are given is um like we talked about socioeconomic conditions and food deserts as an example that was provided um so i'm gonna take that and pull in a couple of other questions which is reparations um sandra is something you spoke to at the beginning and um there, there are some additional questions about that uh i think generally question one is what kind of repara reparations would make a difference enough to impact health outcomes? And then uh, a second question um, to, to go along with that is, what can we learn about um, from, from the United States relationship with tribal nations and the reparations or lack thereof um, with that community? 
Um, let me, I'll start by that. I, um, I'm actually not going to give an answer to that because I'm not an expert in it, but uh, I would refer people to people who are experts on it. And uh, in particular, the book, the recent book by, uh, by Sandy Darity, William Darity, and uh, his spouse, Kristen Mon, called From Here to Equality, I think is a, is a really fantastic book on that. And there have been other writing on it, but uh, the, I'm not trying to duck the question, but I actually think there are so many ways you can get about uh, at reparations. Um, I actually think that some of the more superficial ideas, much more superficial than Professor Darity's and Mellon's ideas um, that were raised, for example, on the campaign trail um, with things like baby bonds. Um, uh, these are all ideas that actually can go towards um, towards rectifying the, particularly the black versus rest of America um, asset gap. I, I mean, I think I actually had a piece that just came out in Politico yesterday where my, my push would be, I think in a new administration, you can imagine a, a blue ribbon commission that actually says, let's, let, let's assess these. Let's, uh, let's look at these forces. Let's look at actually um, uh, cost benefit. Let's do analyses on them and let's decide on a country on which, on which way to go. And I, I sort of feel like as somebody who fundamentally cares about health equity, cares about population health and health equity, um, um, I don't know enough. I don't know that there is enough science or that anybody has spent enough time thinking about this to be able to say, this is what we should do. No, I think any group of scholars could do that. I, I'm not aware of anybody who's done it. I think uh, um, um, Professor Darity's and, and Mullen's book is probably the best analysis. But even they, I mean, they're not they're not really saying this is the one thing that should be done. They are they are making the case um, and really pointing the way to to those kind of analyses. And I will also just say on the reparations point, there was a, a good episode um, for those who get the Code Switch NPR podcast on reparations, where they actually go through several different uh, scholars and their plans for reparations. So if you're interested in learning more, that's probably a, a nice accessible uh, venue to, to understanding some of the issues there. So I can swing it into one of the other questions that I see here. And that is if we don't provide the financial resources for people to do what they need to for their own health, then we're not going to make progress in general when it comes to health inequities and specifically to COVID. You know, figuring out ways to encourage people to stay home, providing those sorts of financial supports from whatever you know, mechanisms are in place, governmental mechanisms, it's critical. You know, so folks are asking, what about this 100 day mask policy? Is it going to work? What about if we do X, Y or Z? Is that going to work? My question in return is, are you going to do it? Are you going to wear your mask? What about your neighbor? What about a family member? And the work that we do is only good insofar as everyone else follows along and buys into it. And as a society collectively in the United States, we have a very different view about our responsibilities to our neighbors. And the concept of reparations in this country is so hard for so many to swallow. And a lot of that has to do with this sort of inherent value difference that we have here compared to other countries where such an idea is not as outlandish. And, you know, I think that the, the fact that I might say it's a, um, a value difference, that's not something easily fixed, right? But it's also not the job of only public health. It's the job of many different sectors. Uh, it's a multi-pronged approach, as Anjum said, to really get at these root causes and to start changing the way that we, as a culture, as a country, start to look at our responsibility to each other. Thank you, Mayan. Um, so pivoting a little bit, there's some questions that have to do with with age and lifespan types of, of dynamics, which we haven't touched on um, as specifically today. Um, so one question is, can open, somebody just added another one and it disappeared, bear with me. Okay, so one question is um, regarding the, you know, the burden that we see of um, COVID deaths uh, among our, our seniors um, and wondering if the panel can speak a bit to, to the inequities there. So naturally we're seeing more cases um, among our older population. Our earliest cases 
were really centralized within our older communities. In Washington, we had a number of long-term care facilities where COVID was circulating quite heavily. And we saw uh, initially, if you look at the, the epidemic curve of cases over time, and we do it by age, it was much higher in the early days for our older population than in later days for a couple of reasons. One, we managed spread of disease better within this older population. And also we got a lot better at treating the disease and identifying it earlier, better testing, so health outcomes were better as well. Now, how are we addressing the inequity? Well, you know, when we have different aged populations, populations with different backgrounds, you know, some of it is going to be physiological, and that's not my area of expertise, but our immune systems do wane over time. Uh, and so with older age, sometimes your immune system is not quite as able to fight off disease. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be providing ample resources to support that community. So for example, if we think about uh, testing supplies and vaccine, testing supplies in Washington have been distributed along a few different patterns uh, and it's changed over time along with our resources and priorities. But early days, a lot of these testing resources were being prioritized for our healthcare workers and those working uh, with our older population in long-term care facilities and elsewhere. And when we look at our vaccination plan in Washington, it's also prioritizing people who are at most risk, who tend to be those in our older age categories, those with certain comorbidities and with certain professions. And uh, a colleague at Department of Health used a really great image with me the other day uh, because she said, you know, folks sometimes don't understand how hard it is to do this um, prioritization for distribution of resources. But if you imagine there's 10 people in a room and you're holding three doses of COVID vaccine, who are you gonna give it to? So we have to take a step back and realize that we have a, an inconsistent and unreliable flow of vaccine doses at the moment. In the early days, we didn't have a lot of PPE. We were uh, inconsistent in the amount of testing uh, material we had in order to do testing. So we have to prioritize. And that is one of the biggest challenges and frustrations I know for those in medicine and public health in the field is that we can't just hit a button and magically provide everybody what they need. It's the same outside of COVID as well. Uh, we can't do it. So sometimes we have to take those incremental steps. We have to build the structures so that when the resources are there, we're able to implement them. And that's what we're starting to see now as vaccine is becoming more and more available around the country. Sandra or Anjum, do you have a comment? No, I, nothing to add. I think what Maya said was excellent. I was just, I wasn't clear on that. If the question that the um, person had was really around disparities in older ages. And so if it was like, let's look at black, white differences among the older population. I have not seen that data, but Mayan would know the best if the DOH is actually putting out um, data that, that allows us to disaggregate in that fashion. So if you want to look and go play with the data, doh.wa.gov. There is a really great dashboard where you can play around with a lot of these different uh, variables and start to understand the data disaggregated. Uh, also keep in mind that to protect the privacy of our population, uh, data are not you know, available at an individual level. And sometimes you'll see things might be repressed if, or suppressed if the data are really small. But that dashboard is updated on a pretty much daily basis. So doh.wa.gov. Um, and let me, um, may, I, may I point out another question in the Q&A just to, just to address. There's a question which I, I, I really like, which um, I think is a difficult question. Um, um, I'm trying to see if, uh, if uh, there's a name. I think it's anonymous. But the, the bottom line of the question is, how can we justify um, spending money on academic work when there's so much that needs to be done? And I, I think, it's, um, um, I think it's, a, it, it's an important question. I don't think it's a question that's relevant only in COVID. I think it's relevant all the time. And I do think that the, those of us who are in the academic world have a responsibility to keep that question in mind all the time. Now, I could make an argument, I think a reasonable argument, that the academic world is where ideas emerge that fundamentally go on to then influence practice. Um, and I think that's probably true. But I think it's, it's an insufficient answer. I, I think there is a, um, a more, a deeper answer, which is that academics have a responsibility to do work that I've called sort of academic work of consequence. 
that um, that academic work should be responsive to pressing social issues, pressing um, um, concerns of our time, because part of the purpose of the academic enterprise is not just to generate knowledge, but actually it's to generate knowledge for the betterment of all our lives. And I think uh, that is true all across the academic uh, world, particularly true in pragmatic areas like population health science. And of course, particularly true when we're dealing with moments like this, we're dealing with like COVID. The, the way the system is set up, it requires, I think, enormous vigilance on the part of the academic wor world to hold itself accountable. I mean, you know, we could argue, I don't know, there's better systems to hold it accountable. Um, but I think it's a really important question. Uh, so I appreciate it, uh, seeing it in, uh, in the uh, Q&A. Sandra, I'd like to add that uh, what we do in public health practice, it's really driven by what's happening day to day on the ground. Uh, and, and yes, we do respond to trends and we do practice-based research, absolutely. But the reality is in public health practice, we have to rely on the expertise and the partnership of our academic colleagues. And we've seen that success repeatedly, uh, even during this pandemic with the, the hold up my phone, the WA Notify uh, program that most of you should know about. It's a great partnership between uh, researchers and practitioners in Washington and in the private sector uh, and through our COVID lit rep that many of you have heard about, you know, this, this is not just research versus practice. There is such a beautiful gray area where we have this work of consequences, as Sandra said, that's happening. And it is, it is a critical part of what we do in both of these realms, in practice and in academia, to learn how to talk to each other about where those gaps are. How do we work together to truly address challenges and bring strengths from both sides of the spectrum? Um, now, granted, we know that research happens in all different ways and certain topics may truly be driven by the passion of a researcher, but who's to say that that doesn't bring value in some way to the conversation, even if it's not right now, it may come later. So it's it's great and I think it's a very good question, Sandra, I'm glad you brought it up, um, but just that public health practice lens for you. No, thank you, I, I, I appreciate you adding to that. The, for anybody who's interested in, in more about this, the, the, the classic book about this is something called Pasteur's Quadrant, which is actually about the work of Louis Pasteur is the inspiration who of course was a scientist who then from whom came a lot of uh, um, measures that ultimately were public health measures. And um, it, really there is a spectrum of work that's work that's for pure knowledge versus applied work. And, and, and where do we, where does scholar, where should scholarship sit? I, I think there is no one answer to it. And the reason I wanted to sort of to highlight this because I think it is a question that should be on the minds of everybody within a university all the time that we should be holding ourselves accountable to that question all the time. And I'll just add, I mean, I, I don't think there are many students that get into public health uh, that aren't in it to make a difference and to really try to bring about change. So, you know, I think what ends up happening though is unfortunately the system is sometimes structured in such a way that that's not always the, in, the incentive, right? There are other incentive structures that disincentivize, uh, you know, real action work and real uh, real change making work. So, but you know, I, I think everyone's uh, heart is in the right place on this one. Leaning into to that idea of partnerships and collaboration, um, Anjum, earlier you mentioned that these are these are complex problems and they'll require complex solutions. Um, and so there's the academic practice partnerships, um, but there's also things like interdisciplinary research or uh, cross-sector collaborations um, and, and other types of, of collaborations that, um, you know, it seems like we need to be really creative and, and innovative because these are not new problems uh, and they're still here. So um, I wonder if each of you could speak a bit to uh, how, what the role is of these, of other types of partnerships um, in both improving equity, but then also preparing for future pandemics or their intersections. Sandra, you're unmuted, so you can go first if you want to break and also, <laughs> I didn't know if you're right about to talk or not. You made this really clear. Um, I was trying not to talk to the camera with mute as I was doing before. Um, um, well, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with perhaps posing a controversial question, which is, um, um, do we need partnerships at all? Like, and I'm, I'm saying that intentionally, um, to, so, so, so what? Why do we need partnerships? So I think there are two answers to that. Number one is, at the end of the day, we should care about improving the health of populations and narrowing health gaps. That's what we should care about. And I think 
there is an argument to be made that we should achieve that by any means necessary. And if that means partnerships help, great. If it means partnerships don't help, forget about it. And let's, let's do what it takes to make it, to, to, make, to make it work. That's, I think, the top level answer. But I think there's a deeper answer, which is that there is an intrinsic social good in partnerships that builds the kind of inclusive web of work that inevitably is needed to create a better world, that inevitably is needed to create better health, that partnerships are, they are positive sui generis, they're, they're positive in and of themselves. Um, uh, and I think that's an important part of what we do. And the reason I started with my question is because I think we in public health should hold ourselves accountable, use the term accountable, I was talking about the academic world, world broad, now I'm talking more broadly, all the time to say, why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing the things that matter? Are we doing the things that help to get us to our goal? And I do think sometimes on things like partnerships, we toss that word around a lot. To be honest, it's like the word partnerships and the word multidisciplinarity are two words in public health that we toss around a lot. I have yet to go in the public health audience and say, raise your hand if you're against partnerships and multidisciplinarity. Nobody raised their hand. Everybody's like, those are good things. And I'm simply saying, they probably are good things, but in order for good things to be good things, we have to use them properly. And we need to hold ourselves to a high standard to say, is the partnership working to advance our goal, improving population health, narrowing health equity, and is the partnership in and of itself advancing goals of inclusion and creating a better social structure and a better world that ultimately will improve health? And I think we should hold all partnerships to those two standards. Yeah, I would just, you know, echo a piece of that. I think you know, Mayan was talking earlier about values. And I think one way to try to uh, influence, uh, you know, the one way that we really learn and grow is by having experiences that are different from our own, right? So when, you know, and I'm thinking really about the polarization in our political system now, uh, and how, you know, essentially, it's a form of partnership, really, right? Like talking to people that have different values than you, and trying to express to them why you are so passionate about what you believe. So, you know, I, I think this is in that way, you know, the second of, of Sandra's two um, comments there, it's the, the value of partnerships very broadly defined is critical. You know, a, a true expert knows the bounds of their expertise. And any expert who walks into the room and says, I'm an expert and doesn't recognize that there are limits to what they know, it's not really an expert. We always say, you know, the longer you're in school, the more you realize you don't know what you thought you knew. And it's very true when it comes to partnership. You know, it, looking at the way we communicate with our communities, the way that we work with each other across university and practice, and also how we work within and across public health agencies, you know, it is critical that we recognize that the different experiences, knowledge, background, wisdom that everyone brings can truly help us to advance our efforts, do better responding to these public health problems. If we're all working in isolation, be it, you know, over here is, is the you know, legal industry over here and over here is criminal justice and over here is public health and over here is medicine. And we're not talking to each other. We're duplicating efforts, we're wasting resources and we're missing an opportunity to truly create that inclusive process that Sandra's talking about. And sometimes we forget that the work we do has to be both internally and externally equitable and inclusive. You know, we need to produce work that is focused on equity and social justice and inclusion, but we also need to go about doing that work in a way that is inclusive of our colleagues and of the stakeholders that we work with in our communities and across fields. And that can be hard to remember, especially in a time when we're working so quickly to try to get so much done. Let me, let me um, build on that if I may just for a second. Um, because Mayan, you actually said something a couple of comments ago, which I was going to build on, which now you reflected again, which I think is very important. And I, I think there is implicit in what you're saying, a call for sort of what I would call technically epistemic humility, the humility about what we know. And uh, if I may go back to something I said a couple of comments ago, I think public health has failed at this quite badly in 2020. I think public health has led with false certitude in 2020, which I think uh, populations who are paying attention are beginning to sort of call us out on and get tired tired of us for this. So I, I, um, I do think that 
humility has to be a central part of scholarship and of public health action. And I, I think we need to be honest about the fact that um, we do not know more than we do know. And if I may just bring it to COVID for a second, we have not been able to help ourselves, but time and again fall over ourselves projecting this and that, and time and ourselves again being wrong. And the truth of the matter is we have not known. It's a new pathogen. We have been struggling to know, and, and we have really had a hard time in acknowledging that we do not know. And I, I'm, I'm utterly convinced that the population is comfortable with us saying we don't know, that people are comfortable with us saying we do not know, and that we need to think broadly, engage broadly, and come up with the best possible action, even though we're imperfect in our answers. I mean, if you look at um, what the stage the pandemic is at right now um, um, in the US or in the UK, let's talk about the UK. It's just easier sometimes to talk about other, you know, other countries than about your own. Um, um, you, you look at, at the um, public health messaging is one of a blunt acceptance of really uncertain science that says, this is what's going to happen. Therefore, this is what we're going to do rather than to my mind saying, here's what we know. Here's a lot we don't know. And in our, in our best judgment, this is probably what we should do, but we don't know. Um, there's this assumption that I think we're making in public health that the expert to go to Mayan's point about sort of was walking in the room and saying, I know, and here's what you all should do. And that's wearing thin, that is wearing thin. Great, thank you. Um, with that, let's see, I think we may, I wanna make two clarifications. One is I'm seeing some comments about the recording. So there will be a recording of this webinar and it will be sent, I believe, to those who are registered for it and then also posted on the School of Public Health uh, YouTube page, um, if I'm getting that correct. Um, so there will be a recording made available. And then two is um, we have way more questions than we have time for. So thank you very much for your questions. And if we didn't speak to it, that's why. Um, but thank you so much for, for submitting it. We tried to do as many as we could with the time available. Um, so with that, we're going to move to um, some, some closing thoughts from the panelists. Uh, so in the same way that we did kind of at the beginning and uh, we're with one central question and then um, each person responded to it. If we look back on this year of 2020, um, how do you think that this field of public health, uh, how do we move forward on issues of, of equity and pandemic response? What are these lessons learned and where do we go from here? Sandra, let's start with you. But I, I was I was strategically on mute this time. <laughs> um, um, I think we are going to head into a next normal, and um, history and experience teach us that once a disaster happens, we, we obviously haven't had something like this in our lifetimes, but we've had many disasters. We pay attention to them, and then we stop, and then we just move on. So, the where I think we're at is can we use this moment to rewrite the narrative? Can we use this moment to elevate the need for health in all policies and for all policies to circle around promoting health and narrowing health gaps? Can we make that case on moral grounds? Yes, but also on practical grounds, on grounds that we failed at dealing with COVID. And if we fail at dealing with COVID and your risk is my risk and my risk is Andrew's risk and Andrew's risk is Mayan's risk because that's how, that's how infectious disease work. Can we use that? to make the case that uh, a healthier world benefits all of us, that removing health gaps benefit all of us. So I think we're going to enter a phase. There's fatigue with the situation, with, with, with the moment, we're gonna exit the moment. There will be, nobody's going to want to talk about it, which is fine, um, but can we keep, can we, and I, I do think it's us, because if it's not us, who else? It is our job to rewrite the script, the national script, such that the country understands that the primary driver of health is politics and politics ultimately becomes policies and policies shape where we live, how we live, how, where we live, work and play. And that ultimately is what shapes our health every day, COVID or no COVID. Thank you. Andrew? So, I mean, for me, you know, one thing that I have found so striking with the COVID um, pandemic is, is really the, the highlighting of um, 
structural racism and structural inequity. And I think moving forward, one thing we can all be doing to really work on that is to look internally and you know really clean your own house, right? There is so much we can be doing at inst as institutions within our you know within the university, within our individual departments to really right many of those wrongs. And it has to start somewhere, right? So if it starts at an institutional level, um, I feel like there's much more hope for transformation more broadly. So I would, I think, conclude there. So our collective memory as a, as a species is a very selective memory and we don't always learn from our experience, uh, but this time we really must. The profound effects of COVID on our population and particularly segments of our population that are already suffering from these health gaps and these inequities, it's so problematic, it is so deep, and the reverberating effects of this are going to be long lasting. And yet we're also entering this, this era of humanity where disease spread is going to be amplified by natural disasters and by climate change, they're all going to become increasingly more common. And if we're not able to get our feet under us and truly make progress in the way that we talk about equity and social justice in policy and in practice, then we're going to end up in the same place where we were last January when we thought we were kind of prepared. We had some protocols, we had some plans, but our structures weren't ready. Our healthcare systems weren't ready. Our resources weren't enough. So, you know, COVID is, is like the 42nd canary in the coal mine here. We should be paying attention by now. We should be making the changes that Sandro and Anjum are talking about. And in order to do that, we really need to look uh, at our, our peers, our colleagues in research and in practice, and to our community members and stakeholders who truly are the experts. And we have to look at them with respect and with humility because we don't have all of the answers. And there's a lot more learning that we as a field need to be doing so that we can actually grow and affect the change that we want to be the the field making the advancements that we need to for the health and well-being of our society. So humility can be hard, but without it, we're, we're not going to grow. Thank you for that. Um, all, all three of your panelists, thank you so much for, for being here today, too. Um, I feel like uh, on a personal level, but, but also very much, you know, the work that I do that's been shaped by COVID this last year, most of the last 365 days has been so reactive and so moment to moment, um, literally since that first case was reported a, a year ago. Um, and I really appreciate uh, each of your, your thoughtfulness um, in kind of taking a step back and helping provide this context for how do we look at 2020 as a whole, not just moment to moment and reactive, but how do we look at 2020 as a whole and with that lens of humility and really see what we can deliberately learn from it so that we can pivot and then move forward with this commitment to, to health equity. So thank you all for your, your time and your thoughtfulness. It's been an honor to be here with you. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Hillary. Thanks, Anne. And so just to echo your thanks, thanks to our three fantastic panelists. Anne, you handled this so lovely. I just want to like give a special uh, shout out for you. Um, it can be kind of an intimidating position as a, a doctoral student to uh, be moderating conversations between leaders in the field, but you did a lovely, lovely job of it. So thank you. And I also want to give a shout out to um, Monet LaForge, who is the the mastermind behind this incredible uh, production and the rest of our um, comms and advancement team for all of the hard work that they put into uh, making this a reality. So thank you all so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, I hope that you will join us for our next health equity lecture, which will be um, on um, the 18th of February and we'll focus on racism and health um, equity. Um, and you can see our, our great lineup of folks that we have um, for, for that event. And I put in the um, chat box uh, a link to the registration in case you can't find it. We will send out to all of you um, 
uh, the link, and to anyone who registered and wasn't able to uh, make it today, the link to the recording when it's available. And we um, hope to see you in uh, a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, I wish you all peace and good health and um, stay well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.